but uh, I hope uh, uh, it will be translated. Thank you, Kartika, for agreeing to translate. She's going to translate the literature, uh, the speech. Um, hopefully, literature too. Um, friends um, across the ilk. Uh, to begin with, I would like to acknowledge uh, the hard work put by Rupesh, uh, who is basically the conversation between me and Ranjit on many matters. Um, we are actually meeting at a very specific point. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge also the presence of media. Uh, you are working for your Brahmin masters. <laughs> 85, uh, a survey was done. 85 percentage of the editorial board and the chief editors belong to Brahmin caste, and that to a specific higher caste among Brahmins. So you are the caste laborers you are here. I am in sympathy with you. And thank you to your Brahmin editors, because I'm also going to talk about them now. Um, thank you also to Brother Raj Sekharan, the lawyer uh, who marshals his handsome attitude towards community, carries legal profession as a service to society, and becomes an inspiration to the people for absolutely excellent review and criticisms. I welcome all of them. Thank you for being here. V. Gita is someone whom we all look up to when we try to understand caste through a Brahmin perspective and also to understand the Brahminical attitude of this. Uh, v. Gita is also a scholar whose chapter I very much appreciated the bereft, the bereft of being uh, in the book Humiliation, and from there it was a sort of inspiration that, that, it, that it came through. Uh, Professor Ramu, uh, you're like a explosive sweet chocolate. You're soft and mellow, but you're also dangerous in your attitude and in your criticisms of the issues. Um, I appreciate you too. I will briefly try to cover uh, various topics that, that I think I'll try to make a sense of it. The first thing we, need, we should understand is, uh, Brother Ranjit, what you are doing is a new, establishing a new attitude, a new style, a new elegance, as well as a new form of Dalit life. You are injecting uh, a sense of confidence and energy among all of us who strive to live our life with dignity as well as to have confidence in us. You present us on a level where we are not there. So I appreciate you for doing this, and that's why they are more afraid of you. They are afraid of you because you are honest. And they are also afraid of you because you are a son of your father and your mother. You are a son of this land who very proudly claims that you belong here. They don't think you belong here. The casteist society has always outcasted. They never wanted you to be part of this ecology. But we are Dalits. We are dangerous people. We can eat you raw. We tend to eat raw, uh, your mothers and fathers, as our poet from Maharashtra would say. Being a Dalit in this society has given us a sort of insecurity. And being Dalit is try to prove yourself as a common human person. We don't want extraordinary human. We just need a common humanity. We just want to be acknowledged as a normal human being person. We want nothing more. But you see, the issues you raised are very important. Because if I belong to this country, country is nothing but a piece of land. Everything else is imagined. Nation borders are imagined. You can't discipline them by putting some physical barriers. We have agreed to this imagination of nation. Physically, if you belong to a place, that means you own that place. In India, 70% of the Dalits are landless. We don't have land to call our own. We don't own it. In major states, including Tamil Nadu, 90% of the agricultural laborers are landless, who are Dalits. So when you say a caste-neutral category of farmer, you are actually denying the agency of feudal castes 
the mid intermediary caste who own the land so india is just not a farmer country it's a casteist farmer country because the people who toil on your land and you exploit our hard work are the people who belong to this new ilk which has been politically being made the new what kanchelia calls the new kshatriya i call it new baniya because the idea of your power and your status is coming not only from your 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 power that you don't have but you are also creating oppression on others because you are insecure about yourself the one who attacks the person first is the person who is afraid of him or herself and that's why they always want to invoke violence upon all of us brother you said nobody stood with you we stand by you because you are talking about the most oppressed most poor people the people who deserve their rightful agency in this land and if land is a question that we need to debate we have to understand if 70% of the dalits are landless people may that means 70% of the dalits do not own anything on this land that means these are the people who are dependent and the people who are dependent are never independent that's why dalits are still fighting for their independence in this country and for independence we need to have an organized strategy and we need to raise issues of common concern now when we talk about raising the issue we need to understand being a dalit means being universal we are not confined by parochial linguistic provincial understandings of what a human being is the best evidence is i am speaking in english in a tamil land and still we share a common bond of love a common bond of struggle a common bond to resolve to fight the oppressors the way they are oppressing us we had linguistic difficulties to but that didn't stop us that is what dalit means it will never stop you in spite of the all the obstacles that have been imposed on you now people always want to calculate the worth people will always try to uh buy in or or they would say you are doing certain things just to evoke controversies and try to i don't think you need any limelight you are a people's superstar some people are cinematic superstars but you are people's superstar people make you superstar and that is a positive affirmation so when people are trying to consider or trying to remake this whole debate that it belongs and is trying to create controversy this is actually as insecure argument as they themselves are of their life so one of the thing i need to tell before we uh, proceed into uh, responding to this assertive dalits is the most feared person in this country if you are assertive about your identity if you are assertive about your history if you are assertive about your caste your ancestors your people your community your culture you are most feared because this country is not providing the opportunity and when i say country i mean to say brahminical country the country run by brahmin and the dominant caste who look at dalits as outsider who always want to make them feel outcast as the pariahs who always live on the fringes but how do we claim our humanity we assert ourselves with pride and that's why to all my brahmin baniyas kshatriyas shudras as well as dalit friends jai bhim to you if you want to reclaim your humanity my fellow brahmin and oppressor caste friends jai bhim is your call to unify your soul with your body if you want to feel that you belong to this world dalit love is the only option why is dalit the most feared person because they love you this society is not used to receiving love this society is always used to to hatred and when we talk about love it comes as an atomic bomb on the caste people because they are not used to love they are not used to giving love they are not used to receiving love it's a transactional relationship they have with their community and in internal circles whereas we we live with love when my grandmother takes me into her arms and looks into my eyes she is giving me thousands and thousands of years of love just with that smile when my grandfather is crying because i cannot get into school my grandfather is weeping about the condition that this society has imposed still tells me hey not to give up on loving keep loving 
the reason we have hold on to love is because our ancestors always believed in love. The day we will give up on love, you will see repeated episodes of civil wars in this country. It is because Dalits have not given up on loving others, we are having a stabilized country. Anywhere in the world you go, you are seeing the incidents of civil wars in the post-colonial countries, be it Africa, be it Latin America, and also in other so-called developed countries. Societies and people are taking arms and fighting against the oppressors. Why have the Dalits not taken? Because they are still believing, they are still giving you an opportunity to connect with yourself. So don't take this as a mellow approach. It's a very strong approach. And if you can appreciate and accept love, you are part of us. We'll never exclude you. We will never deter you. We'll hold you with respect. But you have to come with our conditions, not yours. You have to be our followers. You have to be our servants. You have to be our subordinates to understand how it is to live up to your full human potential. Because right now, you are a vicious animals that are in Africa or any part of the world. Animals are prying on other animals. They are trying to kill other animals. If you are trying to kill other human beings, you are not human yet. Dalits are offering you an opportunity to be fully human. Embrace them. Embrace them so much so that you will forget that the animality, the animalness that was in you is going to subside somewhere else. The Dalit humanity is the most prized object that this community has given to this motherland. Our humanism is beyond considerate aspects of only you and me. It goes beyond human. We take care of nature. We take care of our farms and fields. We take care of animals. We embrace them so closely. That's why the Karupi connotes the Dalit humanism. See, people are constantly asking for Dalits to wait. The progress will come. They are always asking you to write an application. They are always encouraging you to petition. Or go to police station and file an FIR. Or write something to some chief minister or any other minister. Your issues will be resolved. Dalit is a now moment. It's an urgent category. We need justice now. Our lives are taken now, not tomorrow, not day after tomorrow. So if your lives are taken now, you have to fight now. We can't wait. And therefore the bureaucratization of our struggles. That's where my critical comments come, Brother Rasekaran. If our person who is a landless laborer is getting whips on his back by the landlords, he or she, for him or her, the constitution means nothing. It's a fanciful document. We'll appreciate that and we uphold that because our father has made it. We appreciate that, but also we will take into note what our father was critical about. Ambedkar said, Article 31 of Indian Constitution, Google it. He was most opposed to this article. Article 31 is right to private property. If you have private properties, you can expand. You can have your feudalism even beyond your villages. What do we have currently is one person owning 100 acres of land. After independence, the planning commission had made a, a policy that minimum 10 acres will be given to a normal family. The rest you have to redistribute. Redistribute to the people who have worked on the farmland for, less, for approximately 10 years. That means Dalits legally own land. The people who are occupying land more than what they deserve are illegal people in this country. So the people that you are having, the feudal lords and whatever caste they belong to, these are illegal people. They are having illegal occupation of the land. They have made all the policies and all the internal uh, sort of uh, uh, arrangements so that the land remains under their control. We are asking for what belongs to us. We are not asking anything more and anything less. All what belongs to us. We don't want to uh, have, uh, when Professor Ramu asked, uh, why we are only focused on social justice. 
Because Professor Ramu, economic justice is somewhere lost. We need to have economic justice first. Social justice will follow. Social justice, that's why our departments, what do they say? Ministry of Social Justice and Welfare. Why not Ministry of Social and Economic Justice? Because they don't want you to have economic powers. That's what apartheid government did. They did not want the black people to own the land. That's why they have a movement now. The movement is called Black First, Land First. We need to make something movement like that. Without land, our existence becomes worthless. If you have a small police case, you need a certain guarantor. If you are in a small village, what do you have? Who is your guarantor? You go and beg to your landlord that can you please bail him out, there is some wrong charges. Basic issues. Land is that guarantor that makes you confident. Land is that opportunity for you to be a common equal citizen. If there is no land, you are an unequal citizen, you are a subordinate subject of this country. Where do we get land? Government has land. 72,000 lakh acres is funding with government. But also, the government should take the land that illegal people are occupying under the name of various family members. 10 to 54 acres is what Planning Commission decided. Planning Commission now it has been uh, uh, made re christianed into a different name, Niti Ayog. But that's the extent. I was told once that the former, one of the former prime ministers owned 1,000 acre land. You go to his village and you drive, you ride. We have our MLA close to my, uh, uh, from one station to another station, his land. His uh, nephew told me this. How is it possible? That guy is a criminal. Why are people who are opposed to Ranjit not file a case against such people who are criminals? If they really believe in the idea of social justice, if they really believe that we need to create something or do something for the country, I invite people from all the ideologies. Ambedkarites, Pariyarists, uh, Marxists, everybody to make a common agenda. That until and unless Dalit get land, we will not stop breathing. Unless and until Dalits get rightful access to resources, we will not stop breathing. But all we are trying to confine is, Dalits are lovers of constitution. They are constitutionalists. Yes, we are. What about next? That is the kind of question I am trying to ask here. We will never stop loving constitution. We will uphold the principles of constitution because we believe in legalized methods of revolution. We don't believe in bloody revolution because we have seen bloodshed since our childhood. We know what it means to face a violent episode of your life. Ask someone, anyone in your family, in your own internal family or extended family, someone somewhere has been brutally attacked and violently attacked. Someone somewhere has been lost in the prison. Your relative, somewhere close by or somewhere distant, is in police station or has been to police station, has a criminal charge or has been brutally attacked. We know what it means. So let not the Brahmin Marxists tell us that this is the idea of bloody revolution. We experience it. You fancy it. This is your fancy story like Alice in the Wonderland where you want to imagine. We have to constantly keep on telling that we are human. We are not telling anything extraordinary. You casteist people have problem in accepting as human because we are your sirs, we are your servants, we are your drivers, we are your landless laborers who toil without even asking more. You are used to that attitude, but we are new Dalits now. We are smart. We are beautiful. We are handsome. We are expensive. And now that is the most feared aspect because also we are proud of being a Dalit. We are not ashamed of our identity because we believe our ancestors have sacrificed so much so that one day people like you and me could sit here, stand as equal and claim for our right. Many years ago, they did not have that opportunity. They were considered uh, someone who is doing a lower job. And therefore, when I talk about 
land, I just don't talk about rural land. I also talk about urban land. We want access to decent housing. We want access to decent livelihood. We are not asking extraordinary, lavish, luxurious livelihood. Luxurious household, if, if you can give, good. But actually give us decent. Because we are contributing to this economy enormously. You are just not calculating it. In this current scenario, we are seeing 19% of the unemployment is increasing among higher education people. 19% employment is a warning for any state to feel that there is a potential threat from the youth who might rebel. This is a dangerous figure. Currently, education and every other sector is privatized. And when it is privatized, it is taken away from you. That's why we need to constantly go back to Baba Sahib Ambedkar's formulation. He, sta he, sta he clearly stated that we want nationalization of land and industries. Let not industries belong to your Birlas and Ambanis and Adanis who are now going to control the whole entire your lifestyle and that they are going to manipulate you the way you want to. That's why we need to be critical of capitalism as well, as well as the predatory instincts it brings along with it. So my brother, when you talk about the intermediary castes, and many people are asking, why don't talk about those, the Shudra? So the point is, we can talk Brahmanism as an ideology. Shudraism has not developed yet. Because they themselves are fighting among themselves. The category of Shudra or the modern so-called backward classes is not yet formulated. It's not yet theoretically constructed. It's very difficult to pin down. But if this becomes a reality, we should indoctrinate. The first thing is Shudras against Shudraism or Shudras against Brahminism. Because the war of Brahminism is not alone of Dalits or Brahmins. It has to be a composite struggle. That's why I'm giving a responsibility, a job to all of you to be part of a change that you want to give to your children and your grandchildren. This is the moment right now. So you have to consider if should I wait and wait for a moment where I can make an action or should I start making change from right now. I think right now is the best time. And when uh, Steve Biko, a revolutionary from South Africa, said, uh, I write what I like. And this book, I write whom I love. I love my people. I love so much that my love is coming out. If I'm being critical of you, it's the love of a fellow brother. And I want you all to be cognizant of that. I don't want to provide a rosy picture just to be defensive against some mythical forces. Brahminism is a myth. It's, it's totally myth. Not, there's nothing original in it. It's a copy of... It, they are copycats. The copycat Brahmins produced in Brahminic formula from Buddhism. The good principles of Buddhism were substandard and brought out in a most violent and vicious form. Before I go, I'll just end up on two points. See, when we talk about double consciousness, I had formulated... There is, in, in Indian context, there is a double unconsciousness and triple consciousness. I'll just explain to you briefly what it is. Double unconsciousness is the sense where a person who is acting, double consciousness of course is a Du Bois term, but being in the class of Professor Cornell West, I sort of try to think in the casteist context. In the double consciousness, one is a person who thinks uh, of himself and, and the other of the society which is not there. In Indian context, it's an double unconsciousness. First, you are not conscious about who you are, especially if you are a casteist person. And two, the subconsciousness comes from your act of violence because you don't know what is going to be the outcome. The unconsciousness is trying to feed you constantly. The idea of unconsciousness brings violent consciousness. And that's why I say it's a double unconsciousness. And the triple consciousness in the Indalit context is we are not only conscious about us, we are not only conscious about the oppressor, we are also conscious about everyone else around us. And therefore our humanity brings that novel aspects into the front. These are the complicated issues we need to grapple. My dear brothers and sisters across various castes, it's an opportunity and occasion for you. It's an invitation for you to please join hands uh, amongst your own caste folks first. Make a revolution in your own caste. Uh, when uh, Brahmins uh, can try to 
create a certain change or a limited change, you can also try to do. And what I say is, if you really want to be a rebel, you need to be a cultural suicide bomber. Until unless you have that tendency, you are just going to be a burden on Dalits who will have to carry your mental slavery onto their shoulders. And we don't have time for that. We are busy fighting getting our land back. We are busy fighting getting our resources back. Therefore, the idea of Dalitism is just not to claim social justice or equality and, 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 and fraternity. In addition to that, we want material sources to be our own. We don't want to rely on anyone else for satisfaction of our desires. We also want our children to go into best private school. We also want our children to get into best higher education school. We also want our family to go to holidays every other uh, summer holidays into foreign countries. We also want to have an extraordinary life like you all live. If you can't give us, we will take it back this or either way. This is an opportunity for you to come together and think, how do you see yourself 10 years from now? I think if you are on our side, you will see yourself as a complete human or else complete animal. Thank you. <laughs>